Welcome to Agatha Christie, She Watched, our spoiler-heavy look at the movie and TV adaptations of Christie's novels and short stories. I'm Bill Paschal of Paschal Press, and today we're talking about peacocking painters, randy roommates, meddling mystery writers, and sinister ice cream. We'll be talking about Third Girl, the 2008 Poirot episode starring David Suchet as Hercule Poirot. But before we get into it, let me introduce my partner in marriage as well as crime of the fictional kind, Teresa Paschal. Teresa, how you doing? Hi, Bill. It's always a pleasure to be here with you in your little dank, dim office under the stairs. No windows, folks. But of course, that does make for a better space for the podcast. Before we dive into Third Girl, I want to give a shameless plug for a favorite event coming up that is near and dear to my heart and should be to yours too and that is bookstore romance day yes bookstore romance day is the third saturday in august this year it is august 20th and many places actually many bookstores actually do the full weekend uh erotica friday night romance books all day saturday and romance books all day sunday and i'm going to be participating in cupboard maker of enola books they are go they have a very full schedule from friday evening to sunday afternoon i will be at cupboard maker on sunday the 21st of august August 2022 from 11 to 1. So if you want to meet me as Odessa Moon, come on out to Cupboard Maker Books on Sunday and we'll be glad to chat. You know, it's interesting. They have a bookstore romance day, but they don't have a bookstore murder day. I don't know why that is, because there are specialized murder bookstores. I mean, we go to Mechanicsburg Mystery Bookshop with Deb Beamer Beamer on a regular basis, and Deb is just wonderful. And she does cozy con conventions and things like that. Maybe we should suggest that mystery bookstores should sponsor Mystery Bookstore Day or Murder at the Bookstore (laughs) Day. Which I think happens. That's every day. Every time they have an author come in and say, can you carry my book for me? (laughs) Oh, yes. Oh, and I don't want to give you a suitable discount so that you won't lose too much money. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then the bookstore owner leaps across the desk, picks up their book and whaps them in the head as hard as possible, and then drags the body off in behind the bookstore and throws onto the compost heap because after all, you have to build your soil. You bury your body beneath endangered species, they'll never get dug up. That's right. (laughs) That's right. So plant those endangered sunflowers on top of where you put the body and the highway department will leave you alone. (laughs) That's your tip for the day. Third girl. Let's (laughs) move on. Let's move on to third girl. (laughs) Yes, third girl. Right. Which was a novel published in 1966 and is very different. You were worried about how it would change moving it back 30 years. Agatha usually wrote Uh, She always wrote contemporaries, and she rarely tied them very specifically to a a time period, even though she did write them as contemporaries. But by the time she was getting to the novels that she wrote in the 60s, she was feeling her age. She was seeing the passage of time and how radically the world had changed since she was writing in uh, 1916. Now, you you didn't know this. In 1966, she was born in 1890, which made her 76. Really? Yes. I thought she died at 76. So she was 86 when she died? 86. She died in 77 before her birthday. So she was 76 when she wrote this. So she was 76 when she wrote Third Girl. She was born before Queen Victoria died. She saw the British Empire at its height. Two world wars, airplanes, world (laughs) travel. Space travel. Space travel. She saw people walking on the moon. The change between 18... 1890 when she was born. 1890 and 1970 is just truly remarkable. And it does start showing up in her later novels, uh, the ones that she wrote after 1960. She was feeling it. She was seeing it. Third Girl opens, in fact, with Poirot. Norma Resterick shows up at his doorstep early in the morning. She is desperate, a panicked damsel. He's the only person who can help her. And she sees him and she says, you're too old. And how much of that was Agatha herself feeling? Because throughout Third Girl, and I just read Halloween Party, and we'll get to that, and I know Elephants Can Remember is coming up, she was seeing how much things change and how old you get. Because the Poirot TV series resets everything in the late 30s, but just far enough away from (laughs) World War II that they don't have to pay attention to it very much, that's a different world. Mm -hmm. It is a very 
different world. And I did not know how they would make the adaptation of Swing in 60s London, where everybody's wearing Mary Quant, to 1936, where everybody who has any money is wearing um, Chaparelli and... No, not Dior. Dior wasn't really big then. Chanel. Uh, Chanel or Balenciaga or any of the other big names who I've completely <laughs> forgotten now, but I would recognize them if I saw them. Norma Restrick, she's at the centerpiece. She's the third girl of the title, and there's three girls involved. And the way it works is the first girl rents the expensive flat, but she can't afford it all on her own. So she is the one with her name on the lease and she gets the best bedroom and she gets her best friend or a friend to take bedroom number two and who pays part of the rent and doesn't get quite as nice a bedroom. And then that third little room, the little closet which has uh, a completely inadequate closet, no clothing storage. You've got privacy in a door, and maybe you'll have a window, a tiny window looking out onto the air shaft. That's the third girl. That's who's going to live there, and they advertise for the third girl. And the first girl is Claudia Reese Holland, who is the secretary to business owner Andrew Resterick. That's correct. And the third girl is Norma Resterick, his daughter. Andrew took advantage of the fact that his secretary had a room open and said, I want you to house Norma. What's interesting is that, of course, the second girl is Frances Carey. Eventually, you discover at the end why Andrew Resterick, when the family apparently has plenty of money, enough money that Norma could be a first girl and not a third girl, why Andrew wanted Norma in this apartment with the other two girls. And it wasn't just because he wanted her to have some adult supervision. Yes, because Norma Restrick has the reputation, has the clear She's signs. She's batty. She is batty, neurotic. She was traumatized at a young age by seeing her mother dying in a bathtub where yes. she killed herself in the water. And, and of course, it was Norma's fault because mom had been adamant, you have to come home right away at a certain time. And Norma wanted, she was five. And they passed an ice cream stand, her and the nanny, and she wanted to get ice cream. She wanted the ice cream. By this time, dad had already abandoned them for a fun life off someplace else. And she wanted ice cream very badly. And she brought home ice cream. They were, you know, a little bit late. And she brought home the ice cream. Look what I have for you, mommy. I've got you some ice cream and she discovers her dying mother in a bathtub full of bloody water you were you killed me you were too late which and is what she internalizes obviously the mother didn't say that she just says help but but it's the message her. is very clear especially because we've already been told numerous times uh because by this time no that's right when norma was five dad abandoned them when Norma was seven is when her mother killed herself. So she is already having to become the grown up in the family because her mother was always difficult, always a piece of work, always neurotic and needy and not able to cope with life. She was not what you would call a nurturing mother under the best of circumstances. And I would bet you that she made sure Norma already felt guilty. And this really frosted the cake. And it also happens, so happens, that in the same building where the three girls are living is Norma's former nanny, Nanny Lavinia Seagram. Yes, and this is the nanny who acquiesced with Norma getting the ice cream mm -hmm. when she was seven so that mom died. So here she is in the future. See, Nanny Seagram every day must remind her, my mother is dead. Right. And then... She is convinced that she has possibly killed someone. She's not sure how or why, except that she has. And she happens to meet Ariadne Oliver at a party because the girls were having a really loud happening party. And Ariadne's, Ariadne's right underneath them. in the same building and listening to the noise. And she goes upstairs. This is why you should invite your neighbors to loud, noisy parties, folks, because this way they don't complain and call the police. Instead, they join in the fun. Norma is very much out of the group. She is not part of the social set, you can tell. And she talks to Ariadne, and she needs help, and Ariadne suggests Hercule Poirot, and that's how we end up with Norma at Hercule Poirot's apartment early in the morning the next day, much too early for him. I need help, but you're too old. And then very soon thereafter, they discover why Norma was so upset. Who was this person she might have murdered? Why, it was Nanny Seagram, who is laying there in a pool of blood, just like her mother except all those years ago, except that it's a bed and not a bathtub. But her wrists have been slashed vigorously multiple times, blood everywhere. 
And Norma holding the knife as well. And Norma is picks up the knife, the same knife that she had seen in her dresser drawer. And she's mentally fragile. One of the things that the adaptation did, and I think that this was a mistake, when they moved back in time, the adapters seemed to think that nobody would use drugs like hallucinogens, that they didn't exist, and no one would have drugged Norma to make her see things that weren't there. They would just count on her already being a little bit crazy. People have always used drugs of various kind. You can go back all the way to Hammurabi's legal code. There was absolutely nothing stopping the villains from drugging Norma. And I think it would have been far more reliable and far more believable. And I thought the movie was much better than the book, by the way, folks. They really fixed a lot of the major problems with the book. Uh, not all of them, and we'll get to them. But they, the movie is very much better than the book. And if you removing the villain's drugging of Norma so that she had trouble keeping track of time, she had trouble remembering, was a mistake. There were plenty of drugs floating around in the 1930s. Well, they were already using cocaine back then. We've seen oh, that yes, in one of the cocaine, Tom and marijuana. Episodes. Uh, marijuana, of course, and even a simple stimulant would have been able to keep her from sleeping, and that would have contributed to her psychosis as well. Exactly. And that was a mistake. Because then you're relying only on mental illness. Mm -hmm. And you cannot, if you're trying to make sure somebody thinks they're going completely crazy and murdering someone, relying only on the power of suggestion is not going to be enough. So that was, I thought, a flaw. There's also a couple more characters to round out the scenario, with one of them being the painter, David Baker. Yes, and he's referred to as the peacock. In the novel, he's a teddy boy. He is dressed up with rose-colored velvet jacket and pantaloons and uh, uh, jewelry and lace and, and his hair long and flowing with lots of lovely ringlets, beautifully embroidered waistcoats. He went to the thrift shop and bought his great-grandfather's clothes. Teddy boys were inspired by the Edwardian fashions that followed the Victorian era when uh, uh, Edward the Seventh. Uh, could be. You know your British history better yeah, than I do. But, uh, yeah, but it was Bertie, which was Queen Victoria's son and a, and a rake, until he became actually a very decent king. It was a shame he didn't live very long as king, but they were aping those styles at the time. They're very flamboyant. It's, it is amazing how boringly men dress. You think of a cavalier in The Three Musketeers, and you've got past your shoulders curling hair, extravagantly curled hair, ostrich plumes velvet wide lace cuffs you're wearing lace cuffs six inches deep you've got flowers embroidered on your clothes and your sword and by god you are more masculine than anybody you have ever seen mm -hmm. and the lace just enhances your virility and today we just can't grasp this concept but and so a teddy boy in 1966 he is not wearing a neat, severe, plain business suit. He's dressing up. He's peacocking around. And I didn't know how they would handle this in 1937. And they handled it really badly because supposedly this man is dressing like a peacock. He's a painter. So already he is a little bit outside the standard social hierarchy. And other than his open neck shirt and loosely tied cravat, he's dressed like everybody else. I'm not seeing any rose-colored velvet. I'm not seeing any lace. I'm not seeing any embroidery. I'm not seeing any flamboyance. And they could have at least put him in colors. Men in the 30s did have the opportunity to really dress sharp so that they were noticed. But you would have, I'm thinking of some of the characters that we've seen in other Poirot episodes, spectator shoes, shark skin suits, full-length fur coat on a man, a really sharp hat with a feather and bright colors. Well, as recently as Shaitana and Cards on the Table. That's right. Mr. Shaitana and Cards on the Table was dressed far more flamboyantly than David Baker was. And I cannot understand why they kept referring to him as a peacock when he was as drab as any peahen. He did not stand out. Poirot stands out more. Is <laughs> Poirot peacocks better than Yes, than Poirot David. peacocks better than David Baker did. And if you're going to have a, man, a male character called the peacock, then he better be strutting around for the hens 
looking flamboyant and dashing and don't I look delicious and you know you want me. And David is, is apparently is playing the field, but he does have eyes for Norma and he also has eyes for Francis Carey as well. So there's going to be a little bit of, of who is he really after. And he's also involved with Andrew Restrick because he's painting a portrait of... Of Andrew Restrick of, as a young man. Right. That was apparently on the wall of the house, but was ripped off by... Mary uh, Restrick. When Andrew Restrick abandoned Mary and their daughter, remember Norma was only five, Andrew Restrick abandoned them to go off to uh, be footloose and fancy free and do whatever the hell he pleased. And he did not care about cross hedges or the money or family responsibilities or any of that stuff. She was so angry that she ripped apart every single representation of him in the house, every photograph and every painting. She slashed it all apart. And this is an important plot point because it means that nobody has an image of who Andrew Restrick actually is. And the text makes more of this. Uh, he needed to have the painting because then when he has the painting hung next to the painting of Mary, anybody looking at the painting of Andrew Restrick, who's thinking, who had m known him 20 years before, and people can change a lot in 20 years, especially if they've spent the last 20 years hiking through the jungles of Africa, getting a serious tan and God only knows what else. You, you look at the picture on the wall and you think, I didn't really think you were Andrew Restrick because you sure look different from what I remember, but that was a long time ago. And here's the painting and I must not be remembering clearly. And if all the other pictures are missing, you don't have anything to go on, especially if you didn't know him well. And Andrew Resterick was accepted by great uncle Roderick Horsfeld. This is his wife's great uncle. And, and that's the other two characters we have to talk about. So you have uh, Roderick Horsfield, and he is uh, in his 70s. He has gone blind. So if you can tell him the right stories, he has to assume that you are the right person because he cannot look at you and know differently. Sir Roderick has a young lady assistant named Sonia. She knows what she's doing. The connection with uh, Sir Roderick is, with, is through David Baker because David appears at the house and asks to go through Sir Roderick's photographs to see if he can find any images of Andrew as a young man so he could do his painting. Sir Roderick has no suspicions of Andrew. Well, we have to be spoiler heavy. So Andrew turns out to be the villain. It turns out that Andrew is not Andrew Resterick. It was instead someone else. Partner in South Africa. Robert Orwell, his mm -hmm. partner in South Africa. And this was really poorly set up in the novel. And I was hoping that they would do a better job of it in the film. The film did compressions and they re removed plot complications. And in general, it is much tighter and better written than the novel. But they still didn't do enough with Andrew Resterick because if if this really is somebody else, then you needed to have lines of dialogue leading up to the big reveal that not only was Andrew Restrick the kind of man who walked out on wife and child and then never had anything to do with them ever again, not so much as a postcard because he wanted to go off and have adventures in South Africa. England was, in a way, even though they, they ruled the, the sun never set on the British Empire. You had people moving around all the time, and he would have been a well enough known person, particularly because his brother was very important in finance, Simon Resterick, that you would have occasionally gotten word back from Africa or South America or wherever he happened to be from other British expats saying, oh my God, you should have seen Andrew, what he was getting up to in that party with his friend Robert Orwell. And they've been doing suspicious doings out there in the bush with that mine, uh, with that uranium deposit, with that diamond mine, with that whatever. But there's nothing. You never hear the name Robert Orwell until the big reveal at the end. And then when Andrew Restrick is revealed to be Robert Orwell, he goes along quietly. He doesn't protest. He doesn't argue. This man is a con. He is going to say, you better prove it. The other thing that they didn't bring out, and again, I was really surprised by this because Poirot did make a point of discovering that the Restrick empire was essentially a hollow shell. So why did Andrew Resterick, who has proven repeatedly that he has no interest whatsoever in the family firms or living up to his obligations or fulfilling his duties or taking care of his family or showing responsibility of any kind, why does he go back to England when his brother dies? He doesn't care. They could just cash out and send him the check. 
there's another problem, which actually when we were talking about this, David Baker is the painter that's doing the portrait, right? Of yes. Andrew. He sees the current Andrew, but he's also working from a photograph he's got because this is what Poirot dredges up at the very end to show this is the real Andrew. Why would he not know the difference if he's going to be? It's oh, I, he knew the difference. I think he knew the difference because he was given the he was given a photograph of Robert Orwell as a young man. He suspected that something was amiss, and that's why he wanted to to match pictures. That's oh. why he was going through Roderick's. A filing cabinet of pictures to see if he could spot an old, an actual picture Photo of Andrew, of the young yes, Andrew, to okay. compare them. So okay. that's why he had two photos, and that's why at some point during the film, and I can't remember exactly where this happened, but he tells Norma that I have information. But of course, because for plot reasons, everybody has to be a <laughs> terrible at communication skills. He doesn't say anything. Not until the very end, which he finally reveals. And, of course, Poirot gets righteously snippy about it, too, considering all that happened in the in the meantime. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, I don't think Andrew Resterick was handled as well as he could have been, because you should have seen more of his life in South Africa, the various uh, dirty deals he got involved with. Word would have gotten back from expats about, would you wouldn't believe what your ex-husband, your father, your brother was getting up to in the bush. Well, everybody rolls their eyes and say, oh yeah, that's Andrew, a waste of space if ever there was one, a man with no redeeming social qualities other than to serve as a bad example. Because then that allows Poirot a line of dialogue to say, why did he come back? Mm -hmm. Well, there must be an enormous amount of money for someone like this to come back. Except that Poirot discovers that there is no money. The Restoric Corporation is a hollow shell. So that leads to Norma. Is Norma rich? Well, somebody's paying the bills for cross hedges. That kind of place does not come cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, Roderick rich? Why no? Norma has all the money. But she doesn't get it until she's 20. Is this one of those? 25. She's 25. Until she's 25. Right. Norma doesn't get a penny until she's 25 or she marries, whichever comes first, or maybe not until she's 25, whether she marries or not. And of course, again, this this is where you're avoiding reality because Norma is flighty and Norma is batty, but Norma is young and pretty and going to be incredibly rich. So you would think that she would be surrounded <laughs> by bright, eager young men who think, eh, I can live with a little crazy <laughs> in exchange for a few million pounds. Ariadne Oliver was wonderful. She yeah, was wonderful. She was so that. fun all the way through the movie. She has real frustrations with Poirot, which are perfectly understandable because, of course, he's not revealing information when he should or when he could. And you get really the distinct impression that she's thinking like you are as a TV viewer. You know, you have really poor communication sk skills, and the only reason you're not saying anything is because the plot won't let you. This is also the first episode, since this is, the, I think, the third outing we've seen of her, that she's actually playing a role in the investigation. She's going off and Nancy Drewing against Poirot's advice, and of course gets conked on the head oh, as, you a, bet. as a result. Yes, but she's you doing, bet. She's, she's becoming active in this. So it's great fun to see her playing the detective. Oh, it's wonderful. She is really fun. And she he, makes the best second banana ever, far better than Hastings did. And I liked Hugh Fraser as Hastings. Mm -hmm. But she is so different as a Watson, acerbic and funny and intuitive, although her intuition is frequently wrong, but very much her own person. You never get the feeling that she could be easily replaced. Yeah, she has the certainty of her opinions, even when she's frequently wrong. Because that's the way she sees she sees life. She sees them and she sees the characters. And just the fact that she's wrong sometimes doesn't change the fact that she still uses her little gray cells in a slightly different way. Yes, exactly. Let's see. There were other things that I thought, again, they weren't properly set up. The, what I disliked the most about the movie, because it was moving along with great guns until the ending. And then you get the Poirot where he gathers everybody together and he reveals everything and it went on forever. It was longer than usual. 
Uh, I'm sure it was a tour de force for David Suchet to be able to do this long acting job, but it sure felt one long take to me. Well, it may have been because it was prefaced with the return of Norma to Cross Hedges at this party, and she goes crazy and accuses various people, accuses Andrew asking, who are you? Who are you really? And everybody's going, poor Norma, poor Norma. And meanwhile, I'm thinking, okay, she's faking it this time, because of course, Poirot is setting everything up, and maybe it's because we've seen too many of these <laughs> too movies. Many in these movies <laughs> <laughs> i'm not convinced that she's still crazy anymore she's she's play acting and she, and it turns out she is so we have the long setup for that until she's found dead in the bathtub and poirot takes over he doesn't let anyone touch the body he doesn't let anyone touch the body i will take care of things and the police are called in and, and obviously they're in on this as yeah well. they have to be in on it as well as the ambulance staff so you've got this huge behind the scenes conspiracy to get norm out of the house on a gurney with a sheet over her head. So you already had a long afternoon. It's like, like we were at this house party all day and it's night outside. And it's probably 10 o'clock and everyone is incredibly tired and wants to go to bed. And, oh, oh, and wants don't, to forget tell watching his story. Sir, don't, don't forget watching Sir Roderick, who is blind, shooting clay pigeons. <laughs> this is dangerous. This is dangerous. <laughs> even if he's aiming in the air at the clay pigeons, he's holding his rifle into the air to see to shoot the clay pigeons but this is dangerous blind people shouldn't be shooting <laughs> i must admit not having read the book i was i was wondering if he was actually going to come out to be cited after all because we saw that in the in one of the previous movies only he was a cripple oh the pale horse yeah it was, the pale, well, it was one of, the pale, one of the pale horse episodes where it turns out oh he's not in the wheelchair after all and i had that on my mind so we had the long day and now poirot is going through this long and, explanation and all of this stuff that he's giving us the explanation for we should have seen as a flashback not david suchet talking it either should have been incorporated into the film earlier so that he just touches on it briefly and you get a couple of seconds of film to remind you of what you had seen half an hour before or it should have been a longer flashback but most of it really should have been referred to earlier in the film it should have been referred to along the lines of Andrew Restrick is a complete rotter. He is, he's, his sole purpose in life is to serve as a bad example. The only reason he would come back is money. Lots and lots and lots of money. Nobody ever really spells it out. Same thing with Miss Battersby, who runs the girls' school. And apparently, again, this is where you could have set it up that Andrew Resterick was a horn dog and he would go after every maid, every girl besides his wife. And Miss Battersby was not alone. There were that that this is again another reason why he is serves as a bad example because he cannot keep, manage to keep his pants buttoned and he doesn't care and then that sets you up for the fact that he seduced Miss Battersby and left her with a child but again it wasn't really well set up because Miss Battersby is left with a daughter who is Norma's ha Norma's half sister. And then there she is running this girl's school. Where did she get the money from? Because if Andrew Restrick is such a worthless son of a bitch, then why did he give her any money? Yeah. And this is all done. Poirot deduces this by visiting the school, talking to Miss Battersby. She recounts her past, of course, not saying, oh, by the way, I had a child. An illegitimate child An illegitimate through Norma's child. father. And he compares the dates she was telling her him with the date of the school being established on the sign outside and notes that there's a two year difference between the time she left the family and the time she started the school. So and she, so obviously she must have been pregnant and had a baby. I mean, that's the natural logical conclusion, right? And of course, because she got a little weepy when she was talking about Norma waiting to hear from her father. And of course, her worthless father never said anything to her. Yes. And her but, room was a shrine to her mother, but not to her father. And, you know, you watch this and, and then you get the reveal and you think, you know, Again, this is where a couple of sentences of dialogue early on about him being a Randy Horndog would have really been helpful because this is not unusual behavior for Andrew Resterick. Mm -hmm. And yet it comes out as unusual behavior for Andrew Resterick because you don't get any hints that this is the kind of man that he is. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it seems like suddenly he's turned over a new leaf when he shows up in London because his brother died. But no, he didn't turn over a new leaf, but they didn't spend enough time setting up 
who he was, and then they didn't spend enough time where you have the occasional character like Sir Roderick saying, you know, he was he was a right bastard, but he seems really different now, and I'm not sure why. Right. And this, Anything like this. And this Andrew Resterick at the end, who is now we know as, as Orwell, is not really, for somebody who's living by his wits, he was awfully passive. He was very passive, and it just didn't feel right. He should have gone down arguing. He should have gone down fighting. He should have made, I mean, this is where Hastings would have come in. You know, he should have made a dive for the door and Hastings would have been on him in seconds <laughs> because Ariadne Oliver doesn't fulfill that role. But he just took it. I just couldn't accept that. And, and, and again, this is where you need the setup where you've heard the name Robert Orwell before because he was one of Andrew Resterick's partners in crime And he's just as bad as the other. You know, one is just as bad as the other. They can't be trusted. They can't be trusted to tell you that black is white. And you just can't trust them. You can't just can't trust them. And we didn't get that. Yeah. But we did get a couple of nice points at the end, a nice two two nice emotional dagger stabs where uh, where um, Norma approaches Francis and says, we're half sisters, we're relatives. You know, I think she's trying to make a connection. And Francis just blows her off i hate you because you had what i didn't have and i never saw my father and you and 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 again this was i understand why they did this because it made for a tighter plot but i really don't see why francis an illegitimate child of a now successful schoolmistress, would be jealous of norma norma is a little bit older but norma has not had norma has money but Norma hasn't had any easier of a time. In fact, she's probably had a harder time because her mother's been dead since she was age seven. Her mother was always a piece of work, committed suicide in front of her. She has no one who cares about her. And what you can say with Miss Battersby and Francis is that Miss Battersby probably did care for her daughter very much. And I did not understand that. In the novel, Francis Carey is unrelated to Norma. And I could certainly see someone unrelated coming in and saying, wow, look at that pigeon waiting to be plucked. Envy. I could see the envy, but I I just couldn't quite buy the complete and utter hate for someone whom you have never met because they happen to be your half sister because dad was a horn dog. Yeah. And you've lived with for what was it, a couple of months now. Yeah. And, and Francis had lived with Norma for a couple of months. Yeah. And all you can think is that she's got a crazy streak too well yeah consi- and considering andrew and then the final cut is when norma asks robert orwell did my father ever speak of me and he says yes one time <laughs> after poirot had taunted him by the way for not telling the truth yes he said i will be completely honest as i have been asked to be and the only thing your father ever said to me about you is that little bitch she's going to inherit and so it's that final dagger into norma's heart from her completely worthless useless father and her mother was a a nasty piece of work her half-sister tried to drive her crazy and get her hung by the crown we don't know how long her father's been dead in the jungles of south of africa except that he's definitely dead and his worthless partner in crime showed up to fill in for him in order to loot anything that was left off of the corpse And he makes sure that Norma feels completely devastated. But David Baker is there at the end and she turns to him. Yep. But at the same time, she knows her past. But she knows what's real now. She knows what's real now. And that's a foundation that she can build on. Yes, she can build on that foundation. Although, again, I do think that they made a mistake in not having... Francis, in her capacity as Norma's roommate, feeding her a little hashish under the cover now and then, because if you don't know that you're being given hallucinogens, you really have no idea what's going on and you really do think you're going crazy. So would you recommend this? Oh, yes. This is so much better than the book. Watch the movie. Don't read the book. (laughs) This is one she wrote towards the end of her writing career, and it's really not very good. It's better than Halloween Party, but it's really not very good. A lot of stuff isn't properly set up. It still has good moments. It still has very good moments, but the movie fixed a lot of the flaws in the book. It added some of its own, and it didn't fix them all, but it really made for a better story. And I enjoyed it. And I think we've come to the end of another episode. Next time, we're going to be looking at, even though we're, we're following the Poirots in order, we actually already saw Appointment with Death, which is rounds out the Series 11. And so, let me tell you, folks. 
You can read about it at <laughs> specialpress.com. We have Teresa's uh, reviews that will eventually be published in the book Agatha Christie She Watched. So you can get her reviews on that and the one that opened Series 12, Three Act Tragedy. Yes, which we have also seen. And uh, that's also paired, by the way, with Peter Ustinov did the same novel. And those are very different films because they use the two different versions of the novel, depending on whether you read the American version or the British version. The murderer is the same, but the motivation is completely different. Mm -hmm. We're going to be watching the 2010 version of Halloween Party. Yes, we'll see how that we'll see how they did with that. But on the whole, they've been working out pretty well. And before we go, I want to again remind everybody that it's Bookstore Romance Day coming up the 20th of August, Saturday. And I'm going to be part of Bookstore Romance at Cupboard Maker Books on Sunday morning from 11 to 1 at Cupboard Maker Books in Enola on Sunday, the 21st of August, 2022. So if you want to ask me about appointment with death <laughs> or three <laughs> what I thought about slave trading nuns. <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> Absolutely. And this concludes another episode of Agatha Christie She Watched. This is Bill Paschal. And Teresa. And we'll see you at the movies. Agatha Christie She Watched is Teresa Paschal and Bill Paschal. Produced by Bill Paschal. Theme song, Call to Adventure, by Kevin McLeod. New episodes come out every week wherever you stream your content. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can help support us by going to anchor.fm backslash mystery and leaving a five-star rating and review, and by helping to spread the word. To advertise on Mystery She Watched, email peschel at peschelpress.com. All questions and comments can be emailed to peschel at peschelpress.com. And thank you for listening.